this is the last of 12 introductory videos for teaching in a digital age. Um, these videos have been made possible uh, through the help of the Commonwealth of Learning, for which I'm very grateful. And the, la the last one is a fun one. It's on emerging technologies because new technologies are always fun when you're a teacher. So the aim of the 12 videos is to give a brief introduction to the main themes in the book. Uh, there's much more detail in the book itself. The book is free and online from the BC Campus website. BC Campus in British Columbia has an open textbook project which made it possible for me to publish this as an open textbook. And this particular video, the last one, is on emerging technologies. Now there's a lot of hype around new technologies all the time and there's a big difference between the hype and the reality. But new technologies are constantly emerging. This is the Gardner, Gartner hype cycle which I find very useful um, because many of the uh, uh, new technologies, their application in education fit this pattern very much. There's an initial peak of inflated expectations, then a trough of disillusionment when people start finding out what the limitations are, then people begin to learn what the unique or the affordance of the technology is in their particular context, and then it reaches a plateau of productivity. Um, now, the important thing here is that one of the reasons that I'm always skeptical of the hype about new technologies is that education is different from business. What works very well in business may not work so well in education and vice versa. Although it's worth pointing out that almost every technology, with perhaps the exception of learning management systems, started off as a business application. So for instance, Zoom started as a business application, even though it's being used for video conferencing. So new technologies need to be tested and they need to be tested in context. Does it fit the, the way that I want to teach? And for most instructors, they'd be wiser to adopt towards the end of that slope when it gets to the plateau of productivity and rather than early on. But at the same time, innovation in teaching is important. We pointed out that we've got to change our teaching methods if we're going to develop the knowledge and the skills. So instructors should be dabbling at least with trying new things. So I'm going to talk about three emerging technologies. I chose these because there are two editions of the book. And this is what happened between the first edition and the second edition four years later. And there was a big change in that four years. These technology, new technologies became more serious competitors for attention. The three I've chosen are serious games, virtual and augmented reality, and learning art analytics and artificial intelligence. And in each of the chapters, I define what they are. I provide some examples, uh, usually with a link um, I discuss the affordances of each technology, the educational afford affordances, and then I discuss some of the strengths and weaknesses of each. So the first one was serious games. Now there are three categories here. One are educational games themselves, a whole game. There is the pedagogy behind educational games. There's a specific teaching method behind game-based learning. Um, and that data would apply both to games and to applications outside games. And then there's gamification where you take that pedagogy and apply it in a non-game context. And there's an example of that in the book. So Ryerson University in Canada has been doing quite a lot of research on uh, the design of serious games. And they come up with four key elements. Uh, every game should have clear learning outcomes, what it's trying to teach. There should be a good storyline, a good storytelling uh, in, in the game that links all the bits together. There is the playing, actual playing of the game. Um, and then there's the experience of user, users, of students in interacting with the game. So you can have all three, but if the user experience isn't satisfactory, then the game's not going to succeed. What are the main affordances of serious games? Well, primarily motivation and engagement. 
and we have to realize that many of our younger learners are being brought up with games and uh, it's part of their world and they might more likely to be motivated if they think they can learn through 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 playing but also more seriously in my book i mentioned the importance of teaching uh, high level intellectual skills and games are very good for some of these for things like problem solving good communication skills particularly if it's group based games and decision making and also games provide often a very real world con context that makes the learning more authentic so there are in fact many possible educational applications and the costs of creating games are coming down now considerably you don't have to have expensive technology to make a good educational game the second technology i looked at is virtual and augmented reality um, or what i prefer to call immersive technologies where the learner is fully immersed in a virtual or augmented reality world and virtual reality is fully immersive you're right inside that experience um, augmented reality is really an overlay of of a virtual reality experience on a real life experience um, and there's an example in the book called math world the what these technology allow you to do is to identify or manipulate or analyze objects in, in a virtual world. So it allows you entry into otherwise dangerous or difficult to observe environments. And what they result in is, if they're well designed, is deeper, richer understanding. Um, and sometimes the development of skills uh, or getting a skill to the point where you can actually apply it in a real environment. So the examples I give in the book, uh, one is about uh, manipulating interactive molecular dynamics. Uh, you can actually go inside a complicated molecular structure and you can play around with that structure. And if you change one bit, you see how the rest changes. Another one is conducting an orchestra. Um, you have an or you're immersed with an orchestra around you and it follows the kind of uh, signals you give as a conductor. Uh, there's another one on soil, soil science sampling, which is augmented reality, where they take actual maps and then they augment that with details uh, for the teaching experience. And a very interesting one on a refugee experience simulation based on interviews with refugees, um, which raises a lot of the issues around uh, uh, the, the, re the, the, the refugee journey from, uh, from war to safety. Um, and in the book, the design principles behind each of these approaches are discussed. Uh, what are the affordances of virtual and augmented reality? Well, deep intuitive understanding of pheno phenomena that you can't get from books or even from videos. They're often a substitute for dangerous or otherwise difficult training environments and it allows people to practice in semi-realistic contexts. And in particular in education, their applications are likely to be deep but not wide. In other words, you have to choose very carefully the areas where you're using virtual reality. It will be a very specific application. It's not something that's likely to be used right across the education sector, for instance. And lastly, learning art, analytics and artificial intelligence. There are three areas of application in education. One is at the institutional level, such as marketing and uh, recruiting students. One is at uh, general student support, such as just-in-time financial aid and so on. And the third one is instructional. And that's the area that I focused on in the book. Uh, why are these applications being used? Well, there is a hope, and I say a hope because there's still a long way to go between hope and reality, that they will either reduce costs, mainly by reducing the number of teachers required, which is the main cost in education, or more positively, in increasing output, getting better learning outcomes uh, through the use 
of, of, these, uh, of these applications. But I have to say that these are aspirational at the moment rather than realistic. The main areas of application so far have been in prediction in learning analytics, predicting whether students are likely to uh, uh, fail or complete a course, for instance. Intelligent tutoring systems and adaptive learning where um, if you don't learn the first time, it reroutes you back again, or the use of chatbots to go through discussions, uh, online discussions, and provide advice when people have misunderstandings. Assessment and evaluation, but it's nearly all quantitative, testing, uh, comprehension, uh, and memorization. And personalization of learning, where um, if you're following a track and finding it difficult, it will reroute you to another track. And I have to say that uh, looking at all the research in this area, I found more hype than reality, that a lot of this, the current uses are very behavioristic and very narrow, but there is still a huge potential. Um, it hasn't really been applied on a large scale in education, but when it does, it could have significant impact. And it's really important that teachers in, and instructors particularly keep up to date with what's happening here. So in conclusion, first of all, new technologies will constantly emerge. Serious games and virtual reality already have already demonstrated powerful but specific applications. But learning analytics and artificial intelligence have yet to make a big impact on teaching. And again, with any emerging technology, you have this sections and uh, SAMA models that you can use to evaluate them. Are they actually significantly changing the learning experience? I think certainly virtual reality and serious games are, um, but are they practical? And the sections model looks at some of those factors that would decide whether or not they would make practical use. And lastly, I would say that instructors should innovate but should choose carefully and, uh, and should make sure that the applications are likely to be of value to your students. So more information on the book is available uh, from here. Um, and this is the last of the uh, 12 videos. And I would strongly recommend you to actually go to the book because I could only very briefly cover the main themes of the book in these videos. The book contains lots of activities and so these videos are what I would call more content presentation for the actual skills development. You need to go to the book and do the activities and get the feedback on those activities that are built into the book. So I hope you found this series useful and thank you very much for participating.